Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Touch Experience. I'd like to welcome the creators of Touch, Sex, Sensuality and Sexuality, Tiffany Mugo and Kim Vindvogel. And today we're joined by two of Touch's fabulous contributors, Nakane, as well as Roche Kester. We're here today to talk about sex, naturally, and a lot more. Make sure to get your book, which is available at all good bookstores. It's also available online at Take A Lot. It's beautiful. It's an art piece. The insides are wonderful. You definitely want to get this one. Um, and I'm going to do some intros. So I will be hosting today. My name is Ethemia. I'm a writer, editor, and your unfriendly neighborhood sex enthusiast. Um, <laughs> with me, I have Roche Kester. Roche is a Catonian born poet, writer, performer. She has a BA degree in English psychology and sociology from the University of the Western Cape. She used to co-host a popular community radio show called The Salon on Bush Radio, which won an EVH award. And she currently works at Out LGBTI Wellbeing. Arts and activism are just two of her passions. We also have Nakane. Nakane is a South African singer, songwriter, actor, queer and novelist. Having grown up in a Christian community in Tebeha, at 15 they moved to Johannesburg, leaving the church in 2013, publicly celebrating their queerness with their debut album, Brave Confusion. Their debut novel, Piggy Boy's Blues, was nominated for the Barry Ronger Fiction Prize and the Atessa Prize for Fiction, and they found both controversy and acclaim with their starring role in 2017's Ingeba, and they relocated to London to record their 2018 album, You Will Not Die. And Tip and Kim know very well, and so I'll move <laughs> forward without introducing them. <laughs> for being here how are you guys doing i'm excited i'm so excited to be speaking about this book i'm excited to be speaking about um my piece and i'm so grateful that i was part of this work as well i've read most of the essays so far some are, some take a long to digest um those are my neighbors um but <laughs> Um, it was definitely, I think it's definitely great to have a book like this to be part of the queer archive um, and especially in the legacy of queer literature because, you know, it's such a sparse thing in South African literature. So I'm just excited about everything, actually. Great. This is the vibe to be won. Um, I'll be asking you some questions, but we also collected some really cool contributions from Touch's fans um, on our social media, our faves and our followers. Roche, I want to start with you. I loved your piece, a transcontinental story of sex shows in Bangkok, long distance desire and people not being who they purport to be. What made you decide to open up about this experience when the call for Touch came out? Um, you know, for a long time, I was sitting with this experience and a part of me had always thought that I needed to expel it in some way. And I had done it in many variations, um, you know, coming back from Thailand and then residing back in South Africa through um, the drinking of lots of red wine, um, lots of terrible incohesive poetry, um, relaying the story to all of my friends. And then, you know, when it came to touch, I always thought I was going to write a novel about this. But then when this came around, it was the perfect opportunity for me because um, as much as the framing of the book was about sex, sexuality and sensuality, for me, those things cannot be divided from a lived experience and how I feel. And so it also made sense to me to speak about this particular incident to realize that I'm one of those demisexual people and that I'm also kind of confined to, a, to in a way by this activist space um, that speaks so much to safe sex, that speaks so much to um, non-violence. And what I had experienced, in my opinion, was violent in so many ways. And it was also kind of bordering on those questions about how we negotiate sex um, in same-sex relationships. You know, when do you start speaking about protective um, and barrier methods? When do you speak out your truths about complete uncomfortability. And so for me, this was definitely the opportunity to do so. And when I had finished, it was literally like this chunk 
that I needed to let go of was released. Um, it was such a, uh, you know, what's that word they use? Um, but when Party. you let go, yeah, yeah, you let go of the trauma and it was a complete release from my body, from my spirit, from my mind. And I haven't revisited thinking about it in the same way again. There was a lot of grieving going on. Um, for a very long time but um, this story and writing this was a great release for me as well wow that's good it sounds like it was a healing experience in many ways could yes, you it was a little bit of how was the sex for us okay <clears throat> by the first day i had given up on her kindness she called that evening and invited me to the market. I joined up with her and a friend. The conversation was strained and she was blatantly more interested in her friend than me. We left the market and once again moved toward the queer district. As we rode the sky train with a friend by our side, she bragged that I had given up smoking and I insisted that I hadn't. Rather, I had given up on being kissed. I had stopped liking her and I was done with the abuse. After her friend left, the squad filled the air once more. Before we went into the guest house, she stopped and asked if we could speak. She said things were strange. And I was like, yeah, yeah, think. I told her that I was shocked by everything that she had said. And that coupled with the evasiveness, it made me feel like I'd never known her at all. I said that I would have never ever thought of treating her that way. I wasn't even sure what, that I wanted to meet her in Koh Lanta after Phuket. And she replied that I shouldn't. I looked at her. I told her I was going upstairs and she mumbled something. I needed a cigarette. I went to the landing and eventually she made her way up. I looked at her with a measure of resignation and said, all I actually wanted to do was take you out on a date. You shouldn't have wanted to, she said. I'm not a bad person, but I just don't feel like I can stay in that room with you. I think it's best if I find another place to stay. I know this is cowardice, but this is all I can manage now. I was dumbfounded. Who was this person? She bore no relation to the woman I had been speaking to all these months. Where was all that yogic, mind, yogic mindfulness? I said it was okay to feel some type of way, but we could have salvaged the experience as platonic travel companions had she voiced whatever she was feeling earlier. I handed her the key and she left, she left to take a walk. The sixth day after that conversation, we were still sharing the room together and I felt an urgency to escape. Tip, my confidant, after being witness to my tears and my hopelessness from this cruelty helped me out. She found, me, she found me a new, nearby place and helped me carry my bags amid my tears. I couldn't stay with this person. If I had started as an ashtray, I was now a fireplace left unclean. The gathering of the suit so concrete, it was almost immovable. I was not going to, say to, I was not going to stay to shovel the residue. Oh, Jesus Lord. My God. <laughs> My, it, like, every time, sorry, I'm just going to be this person. Every time I read your piece, I was like, Doof. because like, you know, that shared experience where you're like, I see you, this, the person, let's fly and find them. Let's start the, some things in the street, but also thank you for writing the piece. I'm, I'm, I just had to jump in and be like, fill in some type of way <laughs> Every time I read it, you know, like the hurt's still so palpable. I go back to that moment and it makes me want to cry, which I'm not going to do because I look too fabulous to cry tonight. You do look fabulous. And thank you for sharing the reading with us. Our friends on the internet ask, knowing what you know now, would you still travel across the world for someone who could potentially hurt you so much? I probably still would. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. so good. And you know, it's wild because a lot of people have said, you know, um, postpartumously, when I came back heartbroken and shattered, like, first thing is, don't run after another person, meet on your own terms, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But I also think the thing about um, the essence of who I am, and um, that aspect of romance and belief, 
um, in the possibilities that things can work out. Despite this experience, I think that um, I'm still hopeful, you know, I'm not going to let someone completely taint my experience of what I believe love is or how it should unfold. And I'm still going to be a, be, a, be a believer of kindness, you know, and maybe also maybe if I retrospectively looking at the experience, you know, maybe I should have um, stood my ground, you know, more fervently in the beginning of all of this and said like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Instead of keeping quiet myself and letting this happen to me, letting, you know, having been treated so bad without questioning the integrity till the last point when I just didn't have any more to give. So I did, I definitely still travel it around the world for someone. Well, I mean, you're a romantic and I think it's important to keep that hope alive. Um, you know, I think that's something that shouldn't be extinguished. Do any of our other panelists have any experiences about traveling for love, Nakane? I don't have, a, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't have an experience about traveling for love, but I actually had a question. Does the mm. person who you wrote about, do they know about the piece? Have they read it? I don't give a fuck. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Exactly. That's that's good actually. Yeah. And I think that as a writer and as a person, you own every experience that happens to you. And so it's completely yeah. fine for you to write about stuff. That's you know the way I do it. Moving on to Nakane, Cape Town. Oh, Beauty. Just if I had something to say. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna be like, I was the complete opposite. I gave them a draft and they told me <laughs> a new one. The person who I wrote about, I gave them a draft. They said me, you know, I read more. Guys, I read more as to why this is not a real thing. I must change my thing. I'm like, ah, but there's somebody who's edited this. Effie has seen it. Kim has seen it. Naima has seen it. This read more means nothing to me. I was just like, I was just giving you a heads up. You know what? I should have been like you and been like, I don't give a fuck. Now I don't give a fuck. At the time I was like, how? I thought you'd be honored, but clearly not clearly but yeah I think yeah I think well firstly Tiff, I think like why did you do that um and secondly um for me it was also this thing of you know I'm not going to let someone invalidate my experience that is what it was for me it was very real and you know sometimes when you try to convey the to someone they almost try to um you know, to act like it wasn't such a big deal or they try to gaslight you into thinking that you're already acting about certain things. And also, I actually just don't want any of that attention or energy in my life. I've reconciled, forgiven, and that's enough for me. This wasn't a revenge piece. This wasn't something like, this is in your face, I'm telling the world about what you did, because actually you're not that important. But this was a lesson for me in a different kind of way, you know, in all of the ways that I wrote about it. And it had nothing to do at the end of the day with this person anymore. Yeah. And I think writing is very empowering in that way. And that's what it allows us to do. So moving to Nakane, Cape Town Cutie, a user online, says, when are you going to touch me? I am the Cape Town cutie, you should want to. First of all, so they have a comment, not a question, which is very on brand for book events. <laughs> they do follow up with a question though. They say, as a black person in an interracial relationship with a white person, could you share how you remain steadfast in your love despite external factors? For example, if people try and shame you for dating a white person. Ugh. The comments did not come to yeah. play today. They are asking real and deep questions this evening. Okay, well, um, I don't know who they are, so I don't know if I, if I want to touch them. Maybe I've touched them already. I don't know. <laughs> and they're just being facetious. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm very for touching people who mm. want me to touch them. I, I mean, sex is, as, as Janet Jackson said, calm down, it's just sex, you know? That's Wise word. Okay, so the interracial question. Hmm, it's complicated because I've been with my partner for eight years mm -hmm. and my politics and how I see the world has changed quite a lot since I've been in a relationship with him. I was always black conscious in a way, you know. Um, so when I met them, 
they had to tick some boxes and I think they did. Otherwise I wouldn't be with them for 80 years, yeah. right? And I do think that proximity is really powerful when it comes to love. The people you, like, I met him by chance. You know, I was living with a friend and I was homeless at the time, literally. Not in like an acute, like I don't have an apartment sort of way, but I literally didn't have a place to live. <laughs> um, my family didn't have a place to live. And I was living with a friend of mine and I wanted to give him some space, you know? So, and he was, sliding into my DMs, well, my Facebook yeah. Messenger at the time, because Facebook was a bigger thing then. And he invited me over and I didn't have anything else to do. And I went and I stayed the weekend. And Ooh. I've been staying the weekend ever since. And I grew to love him. And believe me, that just like any relationship has problems, I do think that there's that, that any relationship has, a prob has problems. But then of course, you know, when it comes to an interracial relationship, it's much more complicated. There's certain things that, there's certain things that you have to nip in the bud right from the beginning. And that you have to, both parties, that you will not take this, that they have to understand that this is how you feel about this, et cetera, et cetera. And if some of the, and if the person that you're dating who's white, say, for example, and they won't tick those boxes, then I do think that for you as a black person, you should run away immediately because chances of them changing are very slim. Mm. And because as far as I know, <laughs> a lot of white people don't want to change. <laughs> you know, they, they, they don't, they don't, they don't. And it may, it may, it may, come, it may seem controversial, but I, you know, they always want to argue about the fact that they're not racist, you know, that it's not them. Yes, of course, you want to, we want to squash whiteness, but not, but they're not part of it. And if they don't think that they're part of it, run away immediately, you know. So I don't know, I don't have the answer for, I don't have a clear answer for that. I just think that once you've been with somebody for a long, long time, you know each other, you love each other and love is really powerful. And you learn to you learn to separate the world from your relationship, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Because there was a time when I was like, can I date, can I still date a white person? No, like, does this fit with my politics? And this was like halfway through a relationship. And and I still remember I wasn't invited to a book festival. And one of the people who's curating it had said that my work has too close a proximity to whiteness. And then oh. um, we were at another book festival and we were talking about this and they said, um, do I wish that you didn't date a white person? I do. And I just, it was one of those, this was a long time ago. You know when you sort of replay something later on in the years and you're so angry and you say, I wish I said this. But when I was there, I was so stunned that someone would have the chutzpah to say this to someone, like break up with the person that you love, mm. you know? And at the end of the day, when I was like, can I date a white person? I thought, this person loves me. This person has given up so much for me. What are the chances that anyone else would do that for me? You know? So that's something you have to, you have to consider as well. Love is love. Yeah, I, I think so. I think you said um, thing like love is love, or like oh, well, love is the same. I hate that shit. Because, you know? <laughs> because, like, for example, when a queer month or something, and they're like, oh, love is the same. And I'm like, no, it's not. You're right? No, it's, it's it's not. Not number one. Number two, I do think that love has an unfair platform when it comes to allowing queer people the rights. Right. So what if you're not what if you're not in love? What if you're not looking to be in love? Then should you not get your rights? Why does it have to be about what does love have to do with anything? Right? If I want to fuck this person or that person, why should I legitimize my being here with love? You know? So that's just my my little rant. 
about that. I think you. I think you have helped Cape Town Cutie. I think you've identified some good red flags. Um, and I think that interracial relationships kind of provoke a lot of weird reactions. Like sometimes I'm with um, my friend who's a white man, and we are just friends. He's gay. Um, and sometimes older people, white and black, will come up to us and say, "This is what we dreamed of during apartheid. You are the Rainbow Nation." And I cannot imagine doing something so embarrassing to complete strangers in public, but people do it. And it's like, when you are in interracial relationships, people feel like they can chip in here and chip in there in a way that they don't necessarily do in like same culture relationships. It's exactly, like in, in restaurants, in restaurants, you're sitting next to another interracial couple and they sort of go. They oh. smile. Well done. <laughs> Like, we don't get points by dating someone of a different race. We don't get, like, there's nothing elevated about a relationship. And that's what really irritates me about, and even when I started dating my partner, I would say to my family, in people who still prize whiteness as, a, as, as mm. sort of something to, to reach up to, like, oh, you're dating a white person. I was like, no, 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 no. There's nothing special about this. I mean, he's so special, and I love him, and I think he's amazing. But his whiteness does not make him special. It's like when I, when I used to, we, we used to go to, to Kabeha for like Christmas and they're like, what does it eat? Like, you don't eat what we eat. You know, like <laughs> if he was black, would you ask the same questions? No. So why are you asking the questions now? Because he's white, he's, oh, the fact that he's from Britain, whatever. He's the same person. Well, he's not the same person, but he's, treat him as you would anyone else. As I do. I'd love to hear you read a bit of Dangerous Bonds for us, please. Well, this, <laughs> strangely enough, I think Dangerous Bonds speaks to that question and the comment, actually, because it's about a, um, it's almost a jigsaw puzzle, actually, because it's, it's non-linear, it's in little segments, it's quite fragmented, actually, but it's about the character, the character's called the character, how postmodern. It's like the characters' um, re relationships from, from, from childhood with white figures, whether from television, soapies, seeing white characters being allowed to show love and sensuality. Whereas on South African TV with black actors, you wouldn't really see that. Whereas Ridge and, Ridge and, what's the other one? The Queen. Bro? Brooke, oh. Ridge and Brooke were always like making up. Like, the first, they were always like doing shit. Like they were bikinis. They're like fucking all the time. They never showed the fucking, but we they they did not need. It was implied. <laughs> Whereas if you watch TV or even even when Generation started in the late nineties, there wasn't much sensuality in black characters. Maybe in African American television and, and um, film, but not in South Africa. So this informs a lot of the characters' ideas of what romance is. And so when they go to school and they meet white people and they fall in love with the white like, person, they sort of want to replay what they saw on TV mm. over and over again. Anyway, this one is um, from, a tit it's subtitled, It Burns. A friend said, a theory exists that the people we find attractive and fall in love with are replications of the first person we fell in love with in our formative years. The character was a teenager. They had moved yet again. This time it was from Port Elizabeth to Johannesburg. Feeling alienated from their new surroundings, they secretly held a desire to return to what they deemed their hometown, Port Elizabeth, after they had graduated from high school. Certain subjects and extracurricular activities that they were passionate about were suddenly unavailable in their new school. And there were people that they missed, friends, friends with whom they had created solid and dangerous bonds. It was with these friends, three boys, all different races, as if they were chosen for an advert one black, one colored, one white, 
that they played in bands and took part in school plays. It was with these friends that they crossed boundaries that were upheld by secrets. It was with these friends that they all four stood in a circle, all uncircumcised, and tugged at their pubescent penises. These were races by name only, as there was no actual prize for the winner and no sore feelings for the losers. In the end, they all ended up spilling their semen on the dark, polished wooden floors backstage in the school hall. It was with them, they were around the same ages of 12 and 13, that they traveled as part of the band to perform in different cities or countries where the four stayed awake while their teachers and other band members slept. It was then that they advanced their playtime from circle jacks to cumless oral sex. Coming from a blowjob is gay, bro. Inferred, though never said, thereby remaining in the unquestioned realm of the fear of going too far. Even though with each tryst, they were pushing the boat further and further away from the shore. And blunt penises, which interrupted the union of their butt cheeks, moving in the direction of the anus, but never penetrating it. Do you want more or should I leave it there? They want more. I think the oh, audience no. wants more. <laughs> we have to name him. Though his name gave songs their titles before anyone heard them, we must still name him because those songs that the character endowed with his name were never heard by the public. Let's give him a simple biblical name like John. John was the youngest of the four of them, a year younger to be precise, and yet compared to the rest of them, he had the most sexual experience. As a friend who was often at the receiving end of this experience, the character drooled over what was done to them. Things that, that, things that they did not even know existed in the realm of what they understood as sex. For a while, they thought that these acts were only performed by the two of them, that John had made them up, imagined them, used his wits to please them. Because how could anyone else in the world be doing what they were doing? These were acts that did not even have names. This naive delusion gave those years a glowing, gave those years a glow so that when they were recalled, it was with tenderness, not only for John or his always wet dick, his short buttocks and breath that smelled like bread, his silence, but for the days whose edge, edges were darkened by memory, leaving those two bodies bright in the center of one's mind. Tongues were tongues had never been before, wide open eyes, shut tight eyes, wall squeaking hands, labored nasal breathing, just in case someone heard them and proceeded to report them. It seemed pure until one night a few years later when John kindly refused to sleep in the same bed as the character at, at a sleepover. Panting after a repetition of what their bodies had done before in classrooms, school toilet cubicles, tennis courts, backstages, piano rooms, showers, shared bedrooms in visitor cities or countries, libraries, school minibuses. For a moment, the character felt spurred, but John was broken, not by what they did together. Maybe that too. He was just acting out what some older man had done to him. There was suddenly something held in common. Yes, they had the music, the musicals, the plays, the sex, but this, which was so hidden, bore through so much, and yet so little was said. So few details and names were shared. Just small passing experiences, forced oral sex, burning sensations on his anus administered by probing fingers and penises that were lubricated by cheap scented soap. After that confession, they prayed together and fell asleep, one in the bed and the other on a mattress on the floor, cozy inside a sleeping bag. Wow. Thank you so much for that reading. I think um, amongst many other things, your piece really gets to the state before we have words like gay or boyfriend or the kind of liminal homoerotic states that are very difficult to put into language yet you somehow manage to, which is pretty amazing. Because as a child, you don't have the name for things. You just, you, you gravitate towards whatever your desire groove is or whatever your desire groove was created to be, either positively or negatively. 
And sometimes you're not even thinking about whether these things are bad or good. They just are. Yeah. You know, and, then, and, then, and then suddenly someone, or you read somewhere, you watch the TV show, or someone says, that's wrong. And then suddenly all of those things are colored by mm -hmm. that, you know, and you never remember them quite the same. Yeah, it's sort of, you know, memories aren't static. They really do shift with who you are as a person and, yeah. and the time. So Nakane, you're talented in several spheres of the cultural arts. Does writing for books and essays feel different from writing lyrics for your music or does it all spring from the same well? Could we talk a bit about your creative process? I used to say that they spring from the same well, but that's not true anymore. I think, I didn't have, again, I didn't have the language to really ex explain that. I think music gives me a, an immediate rush you know, an immediate feeling of, oh, this is going well, oh, this is not going well. Um, and so it feeds into my impulsivity. I've just been, not, not just, but if a year and a half ago, I got diagnosed with ADHD, didn't take it seriously. And then lockdown happened and I was left to my brain and ADHD mm -hmm. was like, babes, you're gonna have to deal with me or you're gonna have a big problem. And I had to deal with this thing and, I think in the past two, three months, I actually accepted the diagnosis and started treatment. And it's been such an incredible thing to, uh, to name it. Because sometimes naming things is really good, sometimes it's not. But it's been good to name it, to see it, to know what it is, to know that I'm not lazy or that there's something wrong with me. But music gives me that immediate, ooh, that, that, that boost. Literature gives me something I don't want to say deeper, but something wider, right? In that it gives me space to talk about things in a much more extended form. Because I can't, I, I wouldn't be able to put what I wrote there in a song. First of all, because no one has the time, <laughs> right? And second of all, people will just be bummed out, right? There's certain things, certain things in different mediums, you know, that you just can't express. And so what literature gives me is, a peeling of the layers of the onion, so to speak, and going, this is this and this and this. Because music is music is poetry. You, you you find an image and you try to sort of show it from different angles or from a different light, or maybe or maybe make it evasive so that people can see it clearer, right? So like when you see an impressionistic painting and it doesn't look like the flower really, what it does and it's falseness is that it makes you when you really do see the real thing you see it so much clearer and i think songs do that and films just make me just give me a an experience where it is not about me i don't care whether the film is good or i'll prefer it to be good but it's not my film i'm acting i'm someone else's subject if they say that the performance was good i believe them and i move on and that is a real nice feeling. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of, I suppose it's kind of a break. You know, you're focused on a very small part of the puzzle and you've just got to do your job perfect, perfectly and then the entire orchestra will work together. And it's not mine. <laughs> that's that's not the part. Crazy. It's not mine. I don't, I don't have to worry. Like when I clock out at 6 p.m., I clock out and that's it. And that's an, that's an incredible experience. Oh. Nakani, I actually want to pop in here. I was gonna tell you that your piece would be such a great opera. It's like, you say that it can't be a song, right? But like, I'm imagining this table, you know, this dinner table of people just chilling. And then there's this like mm. operatic exchange between these people who come from such different worlds. And that's what I kept on seeing um, mm. when I read your piece, because I, I studied opera. So it's just something that like kept on coming back to me. It's like, it, you could totally have a few of recitatives in there and you know, there's your song yeah. and there's your short opera, just saying. This is Kim offering to help you score the libretto clearly. I would love um, that. I've, I've, I've actually been asked by an orchestra to write music for them. So maybe this would be, would be the thing. <laughs> Um, I've actually got a question for everyone on the panel. Um, going a bit broader than touch, the book and your wonderful pieces. The world is opening up a bit. Um, people are getting vaccinated and activities like group sex, threesomes and swinging are potentially back on the table. I do know my sources have told me that the factory never closed once during lockdown. 
Um, and we thank our pioneers. What happened group sex during, believe me, believe me. <laughs> I was frightened when I heard about it. I was like, oh my God, I, saw, I, I, wasn't, I, I was like, what? People were like, oh, we, we do it, so. Yeah, yes, we were, we, were, we were all invited during lockdown. I was also invited to two. I was like, ah, I wanna, I live alone. My partner's not here, but I'm like freaky deaky. No. We were, we were all invited. <laughs> We were I I was. Not invited to a single one. I just want to say that, Rush. Rush, were you invited to anything? I mean, I heard about it, but I was like, uh, I don't think so. Plus, I'm in a really monogamous relationship. Um, so Monogamy yeah. is the building. How about, sorry, that was weird for me. My, my bad. That's on me. Um, so my question is, what is your advice for some of our viewers who... Uh, maybe have not jumped the gun and have been taking a break from group sex, but now want to open things up. What are your tips for sexual endeavors with multiple people? Who would like to start? Tiff is reaching. Invite Tiff. Tiff's never had it, so just invite Tiff. That's my advice. I'm just trying to show up, guys. I'm trying to. Why, why are people not? Why are people like this? Just invite Tiff. Thank you. If wants to be put on the VIP list, okay, great. <laughs> Kim. Um, well, in terms of like threesomes, just don't leave anyone behind. It's the worst feeling and it's the worst thing when there's like three of you and you're having a threesome and then somebody is like left out. I've read many articles about this and of people who were like just forgotten because there's this, you know, connection between two people. It's not a vibe. Like, do not do that. A threesome is a threesome. It's not a twosome, babe. So connect with everybody, you know, and use all your hands, all your toes and all your genitals. <laughs> so be inclusive. Include all your body parts. Include all the people. Okay, that's a good tip. Roche, Nakane. <laughs> you see, so I'm the boarding one that's going to say be safe. You know, no, um, get condoms, get lube, get everything that's available to you. I mean, I know dental them suck. I swear to God, a man invented that shit because like it's not designed for female pleasure but yeah be safe about it as well but have some fun damn exactly i want to say roche i agree with you about the dental dams i feel like i think when i did some research on the dental dam it was created for actually doctors or for dentists and that's why it's called dental dam and then it was kind of just like appropriated for oral sex like and and anal and rimming and all of those types of things but I actually have an idea about how to make a dental dam better and so that your hands are available <laughs> to you. I just need an investor. So for those who are interested. <clears throat> ideas about same sex. I'll send your prototype. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have ideas about same sex pro products for women, you know, like, I mean, uh, just give me that feather light um, Judex condom. That's the that's so much thinner and like just add like sellotape layers on each side so that the thing can damn well stay and not move like who invented this thing it's not I right. know it's like it's yeah. fucking terrible right. I was thinking Roche I was thinking that they should put it should be like a mask just make sure they space your nose so you can breathe so like put make a mask it covers your your mouth and then your hands are free and you can do all the things that you need to do while your tongue is busy and your mouth is protected. Hello. I'm tired. I'm tired of that piece of plastic. That is genius, Kim. Please don't forget us all when you become a billionaire like Rihanna from your wonderful invention. Um, Nakana, I think you had something. Um, I don't, you know. There's a part of me that really believes that I, no, I'm, I'm, that's going to be a lie. There's a part <laughs> of me that wants to be asexual. I want to be asexual. You know, I'm like, sometimes I'm like, ah, this whole thing. I'm like, sex with one person is a lot of work and I must add another person or more. I'm tired all the time. Now I must have sex with like three, 10 people. And like, is it, like, is it guaranteed that it's going to be good? It, 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 is it? So, and of course not. I mean, I've been to a, like a sex club in Belgium. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And the Belgians are, I hope no Belgians listening to this. 
Like, well, they're very <laughs> Aren't they very quite stayed on the outside? Really square and boring. Yes, like that. But when it comes to sex, they all want to be hurt. Oh. And that scares me because I'm like, are you okay? And like, you're ruining it. I'm like, are you, are, are you dying? I'm like, I'm not dying, just keep on doing it. I'm, I'm scared because I'm, I'm a black person. And if you die here, I'm definitely going to jail. I'm not gonna believe you. Yeah. Right? Straight up. So in Belgium, you know, we know mm. what they did. Well, so we'll see I, the baby son headline. <laughs> South African sing, South African artist in Belgian jail. Yes, for- kills Belgian banker by spanking <laughs> in sex club. Do you know what I mean? Well, I, I actually think, I think I, my, the only thing I, I say, and I always say this to my sisters and to my cousins, I'm like, have as much fucking fun as you want. Don't moralize your sex as long as you're not hurting anyone. Just fucking be safe because I don't know, just just be please just be safe. Again, there's no yeah. there's no shame in STIs and mm-hmm. you know and whatever. There's there really isn't. And, it's, and I think I can't believe there still is a stigma around mm-hmm. HIV and whatever STIs there are in the world. Well, I, now I know. I mean now I know what there's still a stigma because there's people like the baby doing saying stupid shit on the stages. <sighs> yeah. But uh, which is so embarrassing. Um, but have fun. Do the, that thing. The kind of sex I like is the kind of sex where you go, you know, when you finish and you go, oh my God. Like, and, and like you go to bed and you go, who am I? Like, what just happened? Yeah, like, I, this is not the person I want my mom to know. I don't, <laughs> a little bit, of, a little embarrassed, but, but then every time you cough, you go, that's the kind of sex. <laughs> Do you know what kind of sex I like? I like the kind of sex, I call it technical sex. So it's like, it's not sex where it's necessarily wham, bam, thank you, whoever I'm with. And it's just like this mind blowing thing. It's more like technical sex to me is when you and your partner or partners read up about something and you want to try it. And so, you know, the first time you try something out, it's like you're just trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And then it's just like a fun, you, 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 you're, you're figuring out the the technical side of it. That's my favorite part because it's funny. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of intentional communication happening. That should happen anyway, but especially during technical sex because you're trying to figure it out so that the next time you do it, it's just like, oh my God, <laughs> we practiced this. I love practice sex or like technical sex. I love that shit. It's it's my favorite. Oh, and then also Makani, when you said like sex parties, like do I have to have sex with like three or like 10 people? I think my favorite part about sex parties is that you can be a voyeur, like you can just walk around and watch people. That's my favorite thing. I love watching strangers having sex in their little dungeon holes. Like I want to watch you spank each other. I want to watch you do shit. And I want to get off with my partner, make out, do shit. I mean, maybe like go home and do my shit with the person I came with, you know, with the people that I came with. That's more my vibe. Um, and, I, and that's what I love about sex parties. It's so inclusive for everybody. You can be a fucking boy and feel right at home. Like, <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> I once went, this is, this, I think this is my, I mean, I know I have a song called In the Dark Room, but that, mm-hmm. actually, I never had sex in that dark room. I was looking, I was too scared. And I was still a Christian back then. I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, but when that whole Jesus thing was left behind, um, I once went to a dark room in a club that I didn't know I had a dark room, just a bear club in London. It's closed down now. What a shame. Because there's twinks are taking over and it's driving me nuts. Like, <laughs> it's the worst. Like, guys, if you're coming to London, like, the first thing you must do, or, or to England in general, like, find the blacks immediately. Because, because the whites are. Like, they, they think they own everything. Like, they own, they think they own your blackness. Like they think they own, like, which is hilarious because that the way that they talk comes from, from us. Like everyone's like, oh, sis. I'm like, you don't know where that comes from, right? You know that, that, that you do know that your, like your vocabulary is, you do know that, right? And they don't, right? But I went to this bear club and I was wearing like a turtleneck. Like I was dressed, I was, I, I was feeling hot back then. And I went there and people were like having sex and I was walking around asking them questions. And that was the most incredible experience of my life. I was, I was not nervous. I was just talking to people, like getting blowjobs. I was like, is it, is it good? In my mind, actually, I was just collecting stories to, to write about. 
That's not even a fact story. And I was like, is it, is it good? Is this a good blowjob? And they were like, oh, it's, it's, he's amazing. So, voyeur, you're right, Kim. Thank you, Kim. So they're, they're, they're roles. Like, if you don't want to do anything, you could just, like you said, like, go to a sex club, get some ideas, and then maybe you and your monogamous partner or Cher could go home and, you know, do it with each other. <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, like the first time I went to a sex party, I didn't know I was going to a sex party. And I got there and I was like, I thought this was my friend's 21st. And it was wild. It was so wild. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. And um, yeah. When did, you, when, did go, when did you go, wait? Excuse me? When, when did the penny drop? When did you go, wait a minute? Um, when I entered the door and I saw like a uh, person in a corset and really have long leather boots and then later on when they said there are only two rules, number one is you have to be naked if you want to get into the jacuzzi and um, you know, you know, and when my friend told me that she, I just missed her first flogging, I was like, the fuck is flogging? But... <laughs> It was hilarious, but I think think for me it turned into one of those things where I was a voyeur and I remember there was this one girl Mandy coming around with a vibrating glove and I was like, get away from me, I'm not going to orgasm in front of all of these people, right, firstly, but then later on there was this other person and I was like, would you mind me, like mind tying me up? And then I was being tied up and being touched in front of like a whole group of strangers. So it was interesting how the night progressed for the first one, you know? Yeah. And I'm sure that's something we love about this. <laughs> Excuse me. Um... Same night. Same night, different moods. Different moods. <laughs> like, don't touch me to tie me up. Yes, that's, 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 that's my temperament. <laughs> And I think you really hit on something that I think we all love about sex. And I think that's something that this book really gets to is that sex can take you anywhere with people you would never expect at any time. And even with yourself, because like a lot of the parts of this book are not just about sex with other people and like hardcore kinky sex. They're also about like internal sexual and in some cases spiritual journeys. And I think that's one of the things I value so much about this collection so i have one more question and then we're going to wrap up for this iteration of the touch experience what is everyone's either favorite sex toy at the moment or their favorite song on their sex playlist so i'm very into like masturbation Mm -hmm. i this is my shit more than like sex with other people because i'm like ah get off (laughs) you know so but i've got i've got this really great prostrate massager that i ordered online just the first i was so nervous my christian side came up so even talking about purity culture came to strangle you swelling up just talking about it because i've never spoken about it like fuck it but it's incredible i was at a rich friend's cottage that day it said I must go there and write. I was alone. I ordered this thing, it came. Child, it was vibrating. <laughs> I was doing all kinds of amazing things. Like I called my partner, I was like, yo, you need to fucking step your game up because actually we can include this in our thing. Mm-hmm. What is the second question? So I got- oh no, that's, you've answered the question. A little bit. So- before I leave, I just want to say, I just want to say to Tiff and Kim, thank you so much for just making these things, you know. Um, I think that we, we people f- don't realize how quickly time passes and how quickly people forget what happened. Like not just last year, but last week. And it's so nice. It's so incredible to to document and to show how many of us there are. And this is not even this is not even the tip of the iceberg. There's so many. What what I like about this kind of kind of thing is that it shows other kids out there that they can do it too, right? And what I always say is that like, we can't be the only, like you two can't be the only ones doing this. There must be a lot of other people doing it, right? So when there's an artist doing well in, I don't know, in Europe or whatever, so from South Africa, it can't be one artist from South Africa, it must be all of us, you know? So I just, I'm, it touches me and I just, I'm so appreciative and I'm so happy that we did this. I dread 
these kind of things as maybe you saw in the first half hour I was like and then by the end of it I'm so happy and and, and I, I, I feel so much joy because people like the four of you exist so I appreciate you so much all of you I, I just I love your whole face I just I, I I cannot I've been sitting here just watching you and I'm feeling some type of way so to answer your question because I want to piggyback because the masturbation thing I've been going through a weird sexual thing um, where essentially I'm just like, mm -mm, my sex is here and I'm curating about sex and I'm doing things and everyone's expecting me to be sexual. And Effie, we dropped a book and Quirky Quick Guide and everyone's like, oh my gosh, was it just like orgasms and threesomes? And I'm like, no, it's me, Google, I didn't want. Um, so masturbation has been my thing. Uh, I'm really enjoying it because I'm trying to refine my, not even refine, because I don't think I ever had it. That is the really fucky thing, right? I don't think I ever had my sex. I've written about it. I've pontificated about it. And then now um, I'm having to rethink it. And I'm like, oh, what do I, what do I like outside of the, wait, but, oh, ah. So masturbation has been my thing. Um, this was so great to like curate because I got, I'm such a voyeur. Like even just watching you people talk about your sex, I was just like, Shh. Don't, don't worry about it, Tiff. Don't worry about it. Just sit in the background. Don't answer the questions. Just watch them talk about their sex parties. Ooh, it's nice. It's nice. So I, I guess now I've exposed myself for the work that I do. Because like this, it did have a voyeuristic vibe to it in terms of curating it and seeing the rawness that came in. And like, you know, I guess like the three of us saw the rawness that came in. And it was just like, whew. But yeah. No, like, I just have to echo Nakani, just being like, this is such a great space. Also, I love how you came alive. I love how everybody came alive. Roche, keep chalking up them sex parties, please. Because we want to hear more stories. Also, intentionality next time, Chomam. Read the invitation. How about Tom? What did the invitation say, is my question. Did it just say X is 21st, or did it be like, bring your best leather boots and like flogger? Even you, I don't feel you read that invitation nicely but yeah so to answer your question Effie masturbation <laughs> in a roundabout way <laughs> and are you are you are you going acoustic at this moment in time um, no I, um, I don't like even toys I'm like why are you here I'm like it's just me I'm like just trying to figure it out because now I think I'm also very skittish in a very don't startle the animals sort of thing because now what if I I find a toy and I'm like oh, oh my gosh I'm, I'm so skittish right now which is so weird because I have to keep having the sex talks and being like, oh, but you wrote this book. No, no, no. Kim and I have a new origin story, which I feel like needs to be our official origin story. We'll unleash it next time. Yeah, as to why we wrote this book. We have decided the other one is boring and old. We want a new one. But yeah, like it's just, so I am very acoustic right now. But, yeah. you know, I, I, I have tried the loop that we were like, Hoying to everyone, like Nakane, come home and get your loot, babes. Come home and get your entire box. Hey, this 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 one book thing was just—it's not a thing. You must come home, get the box and the the this and the that. We've got it for you, my baby. We've got when it. I saw the people like opening their boxes, Ash, why am I here? I, I was like, why am I why am I here? I need a box. It had all kind. Of, it had a candle. I was like, this is what I need. Like this is this is this is what life is made of. You know, we were very well treated. We've been loving the touch experience. My favorite sex toy is the lube that we were given. It smells like Roy Boss. It's the perfect consistency for me. I love that lube. It's liquid gold lube. You can find them on Instagram. It's locally made. It's hypoallergenic. It's wonderful. Get yourself some stuff. Kim Roche, who wants to go next? Um, so I, my favorite sex toy actually broke. I had the same one twice. It was like, the cord snap. So it's like this little egg um, that's attached to like a remote control. And then you can adjust the settings to it. And I mean, I was horrible because I took it everywhere I traveled with me, right? So I just like throw it in my handbag. Like, and I had one that was like leopard print and then there was another one that was hot pink and both of the cords snapped. 
Um, yeah, but now I'm without that. So I went to clicks and I bought a vibrator. Don't buy that thing. It's a lie. That thing will eat battery power faster than anything. I want to I want to return it and say to them, this is a farce. Why are you selling this to people? You shouldn't, you're stealing people's money, but how do I return a vibrator, right? But then um, my second favorite sex toy at the moment is definitely my girlfriend. She is doing all of the things. Shout yes. out to your girlfriend. And um, sex song. Um, there's a song by Ibs, the artist, called Say It. And it's so sexy and it's half about consent. And it's that, I won't stop until you say it, say it, say it. Tiff is a huge fan of the song. Kim knows it. Okay, okay. It's going on my Spotify. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have questions before I answer. Firstly, like how, what type of wear and tear is happening here for two of your eggs? To be without string. That's my number one question because I, take well, it I, I, was, I used to take it I anyway. I was <laughs> <laughs> and then um I was in my sex song. Well, I don't have a sex song, but my one of my friends recently introduced me to this artist. I think her name, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's Lila Ica. I don't know where she's from or where they're from. But the music is just like it gets me going, and I and I and last night I pulled to I I was pulled on sing to her song, and I'm just like, this is bitch is Lee? good. Is it is, is it Lika Lee? Lila is like L I L A spaced I K E with the thing that Roche has on her name. <laughs> Sorry, the that thing, the accent. Copy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I love. I love that, that that artist now, and I'm like I'm digging their music. Mm -hmm. And then um, in terms of Ephemia, you know how this goes. I told you the last time. My favorite toy right now is not a toy. I've got multiple toys, but they've been stashed away. Like I haven't even touched them in months. Um, I love going acoustic now, and I'm also the lazy acoustic. I'm going to repeat what I said on our previous. Um, chats I literally use my thunder thighs I put my little ankles like this and I squeeze my thighs together for literally like two minutes and the next thing I'm just like done and I'm asleep so that's this is a pandemic masturbation man like <laughs> I'm tired I don't have time to be fingering myself yo <laughs> I'm tired I <laughs> see I can't do that but that sounds fucking amazing that's hilarious. I wish I had more That's like the only time that I enjoy having those thighs that chafe in summer mm. where it hurts because mm -hmm. it's so hot. So like when I'm in bed and I'm masturbating right now because I'm so lazy, um, this is the only time that I'm really thankful for chafing thighs. <laughs> Good for you. It's a difficult time. You need to be kind to yourself. However you're getting off is how you're getting off, you know? especially during this difficult time. Thank you guys so much for being part of the touch experience. Thank you, Tiff, Roche, Kim, Nakane, beaming in from wherever you are. Please buy the book. It will give you lots of wonderful sex inspiration. It's a healing experience. It's about queer visibility. It's about sex. It's about love. It's about rejection. It's about shame. Beautifully written poems, prose, essays, and you can get it anywhere. Take a lot, any good bookstore, online, ebook, and watch out on socials for more launches, more events, because we love talking to you. And thank you as an audience for all your questions today. Have a good evening. Bye.